Thank you, and thank you to uh, Hardman for hosting this event tonight. I'm uh, looking forward to telling you about Collagen Solutions. Um, as you can tell by my accent, uh, we're Scottish. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm American, but we're based up in Glasgow, and we actually have a facility down in New Zealand and an office in Korea, so we've got all the time zones covered. I'm very excited to talk to you about what we're doing here today, and hopefully some of our products will be used in some of the facilities that you just heard about. So we're in the space of regenerative medicine. Uh, which sounds uh, like a little bit of a science fiction term, but I'm here to say that it's not science fiction, it's actually here today. And uh, let's just start with an example. Um, you don't have to raise your hand, but people here may have a total knee replacement. You've, you've replaced the knee, or you've got a mom, a sister, uh, so forth, that may have had a total knee replacement. That technology is literally 50 years old, and it's the state, it was, the state of the art. So if you think about that, um, you're taking a knee that has some disease, some damage in the cartilage, you're cutting that out in a very violent procedure and replacing it with cobalt chrome, titanium, and polyethylene. That has been the state of the art. Regenerative medicine is a way of thinking about a different way of treating diseased tissue. I'm using the knee as an example, there's lots of other ways. And so why not replace uh, the damaged cartilage with a scaffold that will regrow itself, right? The body healing itself to grow new tissue. Um, given all the advances in cancer research and other diseases and so forth, mechanical replacement of tissues with tissues that can regrow and regenerate is what regenerative medicine is all about. So it's a very hot space. There's been a number of companies. This is a, a data point where recently 700 companies received over $3 billion in funding. Um, and the idea is we move from replacing with artificial materials into the natural regeneration of tissues. That is the space that we're in, and we're basically the core service provider in that area. So let's talk about what we do. The name is Collagen Solutions, but it's a bit more complex than that. So we have two parts of our business. One part is the core business. So the core business today is both collagen, medical grade collagen, not the injectables, not the dietary supplement. This is a very specific collagen for building these tissue structures. We supply that to large companies, small companies, and early stage companies that are in the fields of regenerative medicine and building these scaffolds. Um, on the one hand, it's collagen. On the other hand, we also supply tissue. And this tissue comes um, mostly from cow sources today, bovine sources, I'll get into that. Um, here's an example of we take the tissue that surrounds the heart, it's called pericardium. We harvest that through a medical grade process, ship that to our customers, and those are sewn into artificial heart valves. So some of these advanced replacements for artificial heart valves, we supply the tissue for, for those. That's our core business, supply and development and consulting with our partners to provide these products. The second layer of our business, which is um, none of our revenue today, it's all in the future, um, it's all in development, are proprietary products. These are products that we're using our core expertise. We've got a lot of expertise of understanding how to harvest these materials and how to construct medical devices out of them, we can put our own intellectual property around those and develop our own products. Uh, once they're developed and taken through regulatory approvals, we'll then on-license them on to new companies, um, that our same customers that we're calling on today that want a finished medical device that they can put in our uh, sales channel. So the analogy is like many of these pharmaceutical companies that We'll develop a drug all the way through regulatory approval and then on-license it to a big strategic that has the sales organization. So those are the two components of what we do. So how are we going to grow and how will investors participate in that? Um, so there's ways of growing the core business and on top of that, the proprietary products. So the trick about our core business in medical devices and especially these very specialized materials is once our material is in a customer's product, and once it's received regulatory approval, it's very difficult to switch out that product. As long as we're taking care of the customer, um, providing them supply, there's really no reason for the customer to switch. And in fact, it's very expensive for that customer to switch because they'll have to revalidate, typically even go re-go through regulatory approvals. So from a risk uh, point of view, it doesn't make any sense for them. From a cost point of view, it doesn't make any sense uh, to change. So once we're in, we get sticky recurring revenues. Another growth level lever in our core business is as our customers grow and as they launch their products into new geographies, for example, or new iterations of their product, we participate in the upside of their growth. So that's another lever of growth in the core business. 
And then finally, it's new customers. And uh, I'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but we tripled our new customer base rate by investing in a sales organization. So before, it was just word of mouth and a lot of networking. We've put a sales organization in place that is specializes in business to business for medical device companies. And that's how we're growing our business uh, on, the core, uh, on the core aspect through geographic expansion with our sales organization. The second part of our business is proprietary products. Um, we've got three proprietary products in the pipeline right now. One for regrowing knee cartilage, as I showed you earlier. One for helping heal hard to treat wounds, especially with diabetic feet. Uh, and then the third is a spinal fusion product uh, for fusing bones in the spine, and I'll get into those products. Um, so three, in the, three are in the pipeline today. The first one should be um, available and through regulatory clearance in the middle of next year. The other two are behind that, and then behind that we've got a pipeline of other regenerative medicine products that we've got um, that we'll put in behind uh, those products. Financially, um, we posted 4.1 million pounds of revenue and other income. That's how we report our, our grant income and so forth, uh, which grew 21%. We completed a fundraise in uh, March of this year, uh, 6.8 million in equity and up to 4. Point or four million in a venture debt facility. Um, and then our target is to use that money to reach profitability by the end of 2019. And our bigger goal is within five years of our fiscal 16, so fiscal 2021, we're looking to five times the size of our revenue. And I'll get into how we're gonna, how we're gonna do that. So that was a high level overview. Let's go back to some of the basics. Collagen and biomaterials, what are they and what are our core products and our core technologies? So on the left side, this is about building a tissue from the bottoms up, from first principles. And um, we start with collagen. Collagen is a protein. It's in 25 to 35% of the tissue of all mammalian uh, tissue structures. Your skin, your bone, your tendon, uh, your muscles, 25 to 35%, that is collagen. Collagen is a protein, it's a molecule. And the analogy is if you have a cable stay bridge, that bridge starts out with a wire, wrapped around another wire, wrapped around another cable, et cetera, et cetera, and then it builds into a strong, flexible structure. That's exactly what collagen is. And our collagen is 100% derived from bovine or cow sources from Australia and New Zealand, which is the lowest risk of any disease transmission countries in the world. So it's a very highly sought after biomaterial that we have uh, um, access to, and we actually have a plant in New Zealand that's very close to the source. On the other side, that's how you build up the collagen. We can also take tissue. Um, in this case, most of our business is pericardium tissue, that sac that surrounds the heart. We harvest it, we clean it, we put it in a special solution, and uh, through a quality controlled medical grade system, we ship it to our customers to then um, transform into heart valves and other structures. So those are the two basic materials that we work with to develop these scaffolds. So, Starting with our core business, what are the dynamics? What are the drivers about that? Um, these are fairly long sales cycles. They can take anywhere from six to 18 months. And it's a process of developing prototypes for the customer, uh, developing the constructs, um, going through a process to get them through regulatory approval. Once we do that, it moves into a supply and manufacturing contract. So for example, if we have a customer that uh, wants to make a, a bone graft to fuse bones faster, We'll work with them to formulate the collagen, how it surrounds their particular uh, chemistry. Uh, that'll be a few year process. It'll get regulatory approval. And then we'll be shipping either collagen or we'll be shipping a, a bone graft structure to them over time. And that'll grow in a sticky fashion as their business grows. Um, and again, as I said, the revenue, we call it sticky because the switching costs are so high. Um, I mentioned a few drivers of, of the core business um, here, just in a little bit more detail. Um, one driver is we've invested in a commercial team. In fiscal 16, we closed three new deals. In fiscal 17, since we've um, uh, hired the sales organization, we tripled that to nine new deals. Uh, and in fact, that was the back end of uh, their tenure because they were, they were new. Um, and I think we reported out uh, about four in the first, uh, in the first quarter of, uh, of this year. Uh, geographic expansion, we put our sales force a uh, couple in North America, one in, uh, here in the UK to cover Europe and one in Seoul, South Korea, near-term customer launches. So some of our products haven't even launched yet uh, from our customer. They've been in that early development phase. So as those uh, customers um, get approval into new markets, 
or they launch their products, we'll see the uptake from that. So that's another driver within our core business. Um, what's nice about that is that doesn't require us to do anything more than supply more products. So as the customer dynamic grows, our revenue will come along with it. Um, we have an interesting joint venture in China. So China, we've figured out, is about a $700 million opportunity for the types of products that we do. Um, we've, we've partnered with a local group in Beijing. Um, they helped us get into the correct import um, organization that can import these medical grade collagens. We validated that through the supply chain, and so um, it takes a little bit of time to get going in China, but we've gone through a lot of the hard work of getting the channels uh, set up. Uh, research market, there's another opportunity for us. The collagen that we use not only can be used in medical devices, but a lot of the universities use collagen as the substrate to do their experiments. So if they're gonna grow a cell culture, it needs to be on a basis of something that is natural, like a collagen substrate. Um, so the ability to sell into those universities and other channels, we've got both distribution and an online um, store that we've just set up to, to reach those areas. Um, and then finally, um, even though our name is Collagen Solutions, a big part of our growth has come from natural tissues. 30% uh, of our growth last year came from, uh, from our tissue sales. And again, these are all pre-product launch uh, from our customers. So we see some upside there in, in our tissue business. Um, and interestingly, it's not just pericardium. We've had uh, interest in, in a couple of early stage deals in, um, in nerves, in blood vessels, in tendon, in bone. So it's about getting more utilization out of the animal, so to speak, um, into medical devices that we've only begun to capitalize on right now. So what makes us different? It turns out when I joined the company, I've been in medical device for, for 20 years and I thought, uh, isn't all collagen the same? And as I've been speaking with the customers and doing the research and we had some external um, uh, market research do this, it turns out that it's a very, very specialized um, technology and understanding of how to properly do collagen for medical devices. There are very few companies in the world that do what we do and do it well um, at a level sufficient uh, to pass the quality muster of these medical device companies. And in fact, um, almost none that I can think of do both the collagen and the tissue as a single source and a single focus. So uh, from a focus perspective and a breadth of range perspective, um, we think we have an advantage. We'll talk about that. And in fact, some of these, some of these um, competitors uh, up here actually could be our customers as well. So because we're so close to the source and because we have that valued Australia and New Zealand uh, source of tissue, um, there's opportunities for partnerships as well. Uh, so it's a very tight-knit community. So what makes us particularly different? Um, this is not our opinion. This is uh, what the market research has told us. We asked a firm to go and poll our customers and potential customers, what do you think about collagen solutions? What makes us different? And they said three things. They said, from a technical point of view, your scientists and your engineers really work with us and engage with us to understand how to make these structures. We didn't quite see that uh, as much from uh, some of the competitors, so they found that as an advantage. The second advantage is Remember, medical device and medical in general, it's a very conservative field. And from a regulatory perspective, what they want to know is that do we have our data uh, locked up and buttoned up? Do we have a full dossier of what's going to be needed by the regulatory authorities to get approval? And what that means is less risk of non-approval and potentially faster time to market. So they valued our regulatory dossiers and our um, how buttoned up, essentially, if you were, in our data in their level of risk comfort with us. And then the final areas are breadth of uh, products. Um, again, it's not just a one-size-fits-all. If we come to a medical device company and they have a particular clinical indication, we can offer them several dips, different types of collagens, several different structures. In fact, about half of our business are custom collagen formulations for what our customer needs. And then on the other side, we also offer a broad range of tissues. So the bottom line message is, if you have a need in the regenerative medicine or the scaffold space, we have a full breadth of offering that we can offer you. The way I like to think about it is, in the regenerative medicine space, there's a lot of activities with biochemistry, with cells, and some basic science, some very interesting things. But the basic part is it's got to have a scaffold. It's got to have some way to put it in the body um, in a well-constructed way that's going to work. So the analogy, it's like the Intel inside for the computer industry. There's lots of good software out there. We're going to be the chip, which is very steady, and it's going to be in a multitude of applications. So that's a bit about our core business. Again, that's 100% of our revenue today. What's coming out by mid-2018 are these three proprietary products. 
So the first one I'm very excited about, it's, uh, it's the cartilage product that I alluded to in the first slide. So um, this is it, it's a, it's a small uh, plug, it looks like a cylinder, and it's a biphasic, it's got a bony component and a cartilage component. Uh, it's made out of collagen and some other materials. And what's very interesting is this was essentially a, a distressed asset that we picked up that was originally implanted in a, a clinical study back in the 2008-2009 time frame. Um, the the uh, owner got acquired, um, there was a change in direction. Um, we were the material supplier, so we saw an opportunity and we picked it up. And what's nice is uh, because it was implanted and a study was done about eight years ago, we can now follow those patients. And that's gonna be very significant because in cartilage therapy, it's very hard to tell what's going to work until you go at at least five years. So if the one thing all the capital in the world can't buy is what, time. You can't buy what does five years of data look like or even eight years of data look like. There's only two companies that I know of that have anything more than five year of positive cartilage data. Uh, one is a company in the United States that uh, brought some products over to Europe. They're now doing about $50 million only in cartilage regeneration. Uh, the other company is um, a newer uh, or a little bit under the radar and they just got acquired by a big company here in the UK called Smith & Nephew. Other than that, we don't believe there's any other uh, companies that have anything more than five year of data. Uh, the reason we're excited about this is if you look at this uh, MRI image on the left, uh, this is a 3D reconstructed um, image using today's analysis of what does the tissue actually look like. So are we regrowing scar tissue that's, not, that's going to fail, which is a problem with some of these other cartilage therapies, or are we actually regenerating the native three-dimensional structure that's natural cartilage? Very difficult to do. So one way to do that is, a, is an analysis with an MRI um, and an algorithm called T2 mapping. It's a technical term, but basically what it does is it says, are you regrowing natural cartilage or are you growing something else that looks like cartilage but it's not gonna sustain? So on the left here, this is 10 days post-operative. The two green dots you see are the implant. So clearly it's a different tissue, it's a different structure, it's not cartilage. Within six months, what you see is that cartilage has regrown. The MRI, um, the radiologist basically, the readout was, this is indistinguishable from the surrounding native cartilage. And that's only at six months. So now we're gonna report out eight years of this data past that crucial five year mark um, and we should be done, uh, actually this month um, is our target for enrolling the final patient. We're gonna collect and analyze the data and then we'll be able to report that out. That's important because then we can submit for regulatory approval and that will be um, on track to be on the market in 2018. The, the second product is a wound care uh, device for diabetic foot ulcers. Um, the idea there, it's a flowable wound care device that can um, help accelerate the healing with uh, uh, diabetics who have wounds. And then the final product on the right is a proprietary product for bone grafts that accelerate and support the healing in spinal fusions. So those are the three products that we have in the pipeline. Um, and then finally, just from a quick financial overview as we're running out of time, uh, the graph on the left is our traction over six month periods as we've uh, um, received growth. Um, this is uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, the big uptick in 2016 is based on our acquisition of a company in New Zealand. Um, and then our most fiscal year, as I said, it uh, posted 26% growth. So just in quick conclusion, um, how are we going to grow the business and what does this mean for you also as shareholders to participate as we grow? The first level is that core business. As we expand geographically, as we invest in the sales organization, um, as we grow that core business, that's going to be the first level. The second level are the three proprietary products that we'll be starting next year, we'll be able to recognize some revenue from and bring that up. And then the third level behind that are the products behind that that were um, in early prototype phase and then we'll fully resource. So if you think about it as a compounding interest uh, type of story, it's these three layers coming in and developing growth over the next four to five years. Thank you. Jamal, when you do the um, the knee operation, does it does the knee have to be put in plaster for any length of time, or or how does a patient recover from it? <laughs> That's a very good question. In fact, um, we're we're going to um, look back at the protocol of the study to show exactly what it is. But it's it's I guess the short answer is the same recovery period as the 
current standard of care that's less effective. It's not put in plaster, it's put in a post-operative brace, so it's a soft brace. Um, and then the goal of the surgeon is get to limited weight bearing as quickly as possible. So it is not casted, it is a brace, and it's consistent uh, with the, uh, you know, the current state-of-the-art techniques that don't last as long. Yeah. Can you talk about the regulatory process, the time to get through, <laughs> through, through trials, for example? And so uh, a gentleman asked about the regulatory process and, oh, the and the timing. Yep. So almost all of our products are what's called um, in, in the United States a 510K process, which is typically a 90-day review, add another 90-day for questions. You're typically on the market six months roughly from when you submit the data. Um, that's almost all of the products that, that we deal with. Um, there are a couple of ex exceptions to that where, and then in Europe, the CE mark is very similar. Um, where you need clinical trials, so a lot of the 510K, that can be done with bench tests, animals, et cetera. Where you need clinical trials, that's typically a two to three year process. Um, there's two products that we're involved with that would require that. One is the knee cartilage, not in Europe, but in the United States, the United States an outlier. All of our models and our growth assumes zero revenue in the United States. So we're assuming only outside of the US uh, revenue. If we get a partner for the US that's willing to fund and take the time, that's an upside to the model. Um, the other one is heart valves, and that's also a clinical trial. And again, one of ours is coming a little bit closer to fruition. Yep. My question was on demand and supply. So you're mm -hmm. talking about the supply of collagen to your customers, and as they grow, um, they will obviously need more products. So do you have a clear view, an outline of exactly when that will happen so that you have enough products at the right time? No, that's a, that's a great question. So um, yes and no, I think, is the best way to answer that. And it, um, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge with our customers that... Um, their forecasting is uh, not always provided to us, so we have to be a bit reactionary. Um, we ran into a bit of an issue with that probably, I would say, last year. The obvious solution is to stock up a little bit and to create a little bit of buffer in the supply chain. So um, it's getting better, and that's just standard OEM business where you get involved with your customer supply chain to understand you know, their demand needs. And, and can you store this product? Does it have, are there any special conditions to store it or you can stock up and keep it for three, six, 12 months? Yeah, not? typically six months and fewer is what we're looking for for internal shelf lives. Um, and it does have special storage conditions, usually refrigeration, which we have the facilities for both in, uh, um, in Scotland as well as in New Zealand. Why bovine tissue as opposed to pigs or rats? And uh, secondly, um, do you have any problem with... Uh, immune rejection response, and how, if so, how would you deal with that? Thank you for the question. So um, there's nothing wrong with, with porcine sources as well. In fact, a few of um, our customers have asked to supply it. We do have access to it. Um, this goes back to medical device companies are very conservative. Bovine in the literature has decades of, of data. Porcine has some data as well. Bovine, uh, for us, um, it's a little bit more well characterized. We have the access to the Australia, New Zealand, which is the highest level of safety. So it really goes back to what the industry and the customers demand. Um, and bovine and porcine, and depending on the market, one's a little bit more than the other. Um, the second question is uh, with respect to disease transmission. So um, with respect to our bovine sources, we do do full um, viral inactivation studies. Um, and even though that there's no sources of um, mad cow disease in Australia and New Zealand, we show that through a process, even if there was a virus, we can reduce the risk of a virus surviving by um, a billion fold. So we proactively um, test against that. I was asking about immune uh, response, Re rejection, immune rejection. Is right, so that, if... It is not if the scaffold is constructed correctly. So the reason you would get an immune response is either an improper cleaning process or a structure that the body rejects, uh, sees as foreign and as non-self. So that's part of the design process, typically tested in the animals to make sure that there's not a response. We've had no, no issues with that so far. Yep. 